Watch this. The state house is quiet, almost too quiet. Well, no, the lawmakers haven't quite gone home for the summer just yet, but this recess they're on, well, it did just set a new record. And wouldn't you know it, even that brought on some more debate. They thought they might have to shut down for good, but after months of living in the unknown, one local restaurant is back, and they hope better and more permanently than ever. The landlocked state of Idaho owes a big chunk of its history to a line of well-known tropical islands. It just wasn't well-known on how to spell it. Hawaii Five-0? Nah. Awahi 208. So not a whole lot happened around the state house today, like not at all, both in the House and the Senate. They're in the middle of a recess that goes into the middle of next week. Taking a break of five business days, which is the amount of time the governor legally has to sign or veto any bills that come across his desk. And they're hoping that by the time they come back to wrap things up and if they need to revisit or override any video, they can do that then. They are planning to take a per diem allowance for these five days. They decided that last night, but it wasn't without some lawmakers asking for it. Republican representatives Heather Scott, Vito Bar Barbieri and Dorothy Moon all raised objections to turning down the per diem. Representative Heather Scott, who lives way up north in the Panhandle, well, she made a point of saying how expensive it is to live in Boise, saying she may have to use money from her campaign fund to in order to cover the cost. While Barbieri said, quote, it just seems to me that if we're in session, we should be paid per diem. And if we can't be productive, that's just the way it has to be sometimes, end quote. But Representative Megan Blanksma, who lives in Hammett, east of Mountain Home, said she believes they can all agree. They all, all lawmakers, they all want to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Well, yesterday we told you how much it would cost should they get paid per diem per pause like this one. In addition to the annual base salary, they all get well, no matter how that long that legislative session lasts, there's a stipend to help pay for daily expenses. For lawmakers living in districts within 50 miles of the state house, they get they get $71 per day. Outside of that 50 mile radius, it's $139 per day. That $139 per day isn't the only additional compensation either that they get. They also get what's called a constituent service allowance, which ranges from $400 to $3,200, depending on the size of their district. And those who live in geographically larger districts obviously get a larger payout. Plus, there's mileage compensation to consider. And this is where that $35,000 a day cost of session comes from. And that would be extra days for every day they go beyond their average session length of 90 days. And so far, the extra per diem alone has cost Idaho taxpayers an extra $735,000 and adding another, another 175,000 to that total, well, you can understand why despite Representative Scott's pleas, they decided to turn down a per diem for next week. And if you think it's expensive to live in the Boise area for a few months or maybe a little longer, try it even longer than that. Maybe those property tax breaks would have had a much bigger consideration if you had to feel the pain a little longer, right? Maybe, I don't know. Both the House and the Senate will reconvene next Wednesday, and that would be on day 122, meaning this will become the longest legislative session in state history, breaking the previous record of 118 set back in 2003. So congratulations. That day total is assuming they don't have to spend any more time than planned trying to override a veto possibly, two of which have already failed this session. Both of those had to do with limiting the governor's powers to declare and even during an emergency. Well, as we said yesterday, those vetoes and uh, failed overrides in the Senate didn't stop them from trying again. Before they left yesterday, both the House and the Senate passed three similar bills aimed at limiting the governor's powers during an emergency. All three now sitting on his desk waiting for his signature. House Bill 391 forbids any restrictions on constitutional rights, specifically that Idahoans would still be allowed to peacefully assemble, go to church, keep their guns in a state of emergency. House Bill 392 says the governor cannot change any law during a declared emergency, though he could suspend enforcement of it. And House Bill 393, which says that if any restrictions are made during an emergency, they must be done so to, quote, protect life or property from the occurrence or imminent threat of the state of disaster emergency threatening the safety of persons or property. I should say of persons or property. So kind of watered down versions of what they sent to the governor last time. 
In addition, the Senate also passed a replacement bill for the one that was previously vetoed. That would be Senate Bill 1217. It's aimed at protecting workers and constitutional rights, and it reaffirms the legislature's authority during emergencies. The difference this time, well, members of the Senate say they worked with Governor Little on all four of those new bills. In anticipation, he will sign them this time. Less than three months into his first term, Ada County Commissioner Ryan Davidson has already had two questionable moments as a member of the board. And now one of those moments has led to him being investigated by the Idaho Attorney General. We received confirmation this week after filing a public records request that was denied because what we asked about any complaints filed against Davidson since March 1st, well, they're part of a pending investigation. Huh? This all stems from what happened at the Ada County Courthouse back in March when people's rights leader Ammon Bundy, along with Aaron Von Schmidt, well, they were scheduled to appear in court to defend their charges of trespassing and obstruction. That happened at the State House last summer. But back in March, this video that you're seeing right here outside the courthouse, Ammon refused to wear a mask to get inside, something that was required by the state Supreme Court. And you can see Ryan Davidson right there talking to Bundy and his group. Davidson was heard on camera that that morning telling those outside he asked the judge inside to accommodate Bundy and his supporters, basically to allow them inside without masks. He also said he tried to get the judge to reverse the failure to appear warrant that that judge just issued because Bundy couldn't get inside without a mask. Those words are what caused the group, the Idaho 97, to file two complaints with the attorney general. We spoke with the executive director of Idaho 97 right after he filed those complaints, and he told us he requested Davidson be investigated for violating Idaho's bribery and corruption statute. Now, we did ask the attorney general's office about that back then, but they declined comment. So this week, something I learned, well, I guess it's all about how you phrase your questions. It was one of the most popular restaurants in downtown Boise, and then COVID forced it to close its doors. Now, nearly a year later, it's finally back open. You know what is always open? The 208 text line. And the number is on your screen. 208-321-5614. Send us your questions and your comments about pretty much anything. Just make sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We might read yours at the end of the show. All right, well, pre-pandemic, Juniper on 8th Street, downtown Boise, pretty popular spot on a pretty popular block. Trying to get a table there on a weekend without a wait, almost impossible. Then COVID came, and like most other restaurants in town, Juniper decided the risk wasn't worth any type of reward, and they shut down completely last August. After quite a roller coaster ride of emotions, financial planning, well, Juniper is now back open for service. So how did they do it? Katya Stepovic has that story. When taking a stroll down 8th Street, it's almost unrecognizable when you compare it to how it looked more than a year ago. People are laughing and talking and, and you just get this overall vibe 
this fun. But for the popular joint Juniper, for eight months long, that vibe was non-existent. The love and the passion isn't there when you're throwing things into go boxes. Married couple Casey Montgomery and Shannon Lincoln opened Juniper seven years ago, and they never could have predicted having no other choice but to close their doors. We just felt it made the most financial sense, and just from a, a, the a risk factor for our employees, um, it's just something we had to do. It was really hard, really hard. There was a time definitely where we were like, maybe we shouldn't reopen. But that was short-lived, and the couple weathered the pandemic storm as best as they could. We had a lot of conversations where we were going back and forth, but I don't think ever in our hearts we were ready to um, give up on it. The couple credits life savings, PPP money, and sales from their pizza shops that kept them holding on for eight months. And as of yesterday, their doors are open once again. And what kept them going? So many people have reached out and said, you know, you're such an important part of our lives that I met my wife there or I had my 40th birthday party yeah. there. And that has been something sort of surprising for us, seeing our neighbors with patios full and life coming back to the street has just been really, it's been rewarding to just see like we stuck it out and made it through all of that. With a reimagined menu, spaced out seating, high back booths and reduced capacity, Juniper is back and hopefully this time for good. People started coming in and uh, it really was special. They come walking in the door and uh, they're so happy to see you and you're so happy to see them and it, it, it is great. It's great to be back open. Now Juniper is taking a very cautious approach to their reopening plan. They're increasing capacity bit by bit, but one of the challenges they face that is absolutely not an isolated incident right now is of course employment. So many restaurants, some that even opened in April that I reached out to today, Cheeky Teo, Kin and Petite Four all have this issue. And it was partially the reason why some of them couldn't even be in the story to go on camera today. So they're really absolutely looking for that support right now, Brian. Yeah, that's kind of what the, a lot of these restaurants and even small businesses are running into. It's that, well, we want to reopen. We want to get back to full-time service. We don't have the people to provide that kind of service yet. All right, thank you very much, Katya. But this will be something that we're going to keep an eye on as we get through this, as we get to these wrapping up of, I guess, opening back up. We'll keep an eye on how these employment questions get answered. Thank you. You ask the questions, we try to find the answers. And we're going to tell you what we found out on a couple of them today, from the mountains out west to the routes running through town. We're going to share some of the unique history of Idaho. So we want you to ask us some more questions. Well, now's the time to do that. 208-321-5614. Text us, or you can even tell us about it on social media. We're on all the big ones. Anything about Idaho you want us to explore? Well, it might take us some time, but we're going to try to find the right answer. Send us a text with your name and the hashtag the 208. That way we make sure who's asking.
made a call out for historical questions this week, and we got several responses like this one from Sherry. I would love it if new residents of Idaho learned about how the Hawaii mountains got their name. Hawaii being the old way to call Hawaii, of course, and how it's connected to the mystery. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is this your story, Sherry, or are we telling the story? We'll get to that. You kind of just ruined it it's right there in the pun. Oh, well, we'll get to it. Yes, Hawaii is the old phonetic white man way to say and spell Hawaii. What does that have to do with Idaho, though? Well, it has to do with Captain John Cook, the Canadian fur trade, and the idea that having Hawaiians in your hunting party might make it easier to deal with Native Americans. Tonight, we're getting to know Idaho and how the Pacific Islands played a part in its history. It's the oldest county in Idaho. In 1863, Oahe County was the first to be organized and named. But about that name. That's a whole story, you know. And to help tell it, we asked Eric Garzvo, director of the Oahe County Historical Museum, who's heard this question a time or two. Yeah, it comes up quite a bit. Where does Oahe, you know, how do you say it, how do you spell it, and where does it come from? It comes from a place far away from Idaho. In the early 1800s, the Northwest Fur Company out of Canada went looking for workers from a place legendary British Captain James Cook called Oahe. Around 1818, according to Eric's, Donald Mackenzie, working for the company, led an expedition that included three Hawaiians through the Pacific Northwest. They came into the uh, rugged frontier here, so they really forged up the Columbia River and got all the way up into this border of Idaho, Oregon area, and then he separated his crew. The Hawaiians were kept together, and that summer were sent off to set up traps. Mackenzie wrote about it in his journal. And his quote is, uh, three Hawaiis, spelled the way we spell it, Hawaii, went along a small river to trap where no danger was seen. But they must have found some. Probably the, a year later, they were supposed to reconvene with Mackenzie, and they never did. And they located the camp along the small river where they were camping, but they were nowhere to be found. And by at least 1820s, 1821, maps and other fur traders and other people coming out were already using that the name Owyhee River. And they were writing it on maps. So that little river started bearing their name of the lost Hawaiians right away, and it has never changed. And that's how Idaho's first county came to be named after our country's last state. They got lost, and um, but we didn't forget them. Well, just how they were lost, we'd never learned. Although some assume and speculated it could have been Native Americans, but that couldn't ever be proven. The county got the name, but first it was the river and then the mountains, and then there was even a stage stop once in Ada County named after it. And as Eric said, even the Snake River wasn't always known as the Snake River, but the Wahis have had the same name since. Well, it was hot in Owyhee County today and in Boise. Take a look at the temperature. We hit 90. We just did it at the top of the hour. So 90 degrees for the high temperature. The record's 95. Looks like the record's going to stand back in 1947. But we've got a beautiful day, as you can see, outside with sunshine. Of course, we do have the heat. And Ontario hit 91. Nampa has 91 degrees. Boise, 85. Mountain locations, mainly the mid-70s, along with that 90-degree high for Boise today. Winds for tomorrow. Winds tonight. We had a wind gust already up to 32 miles an hour. And we're going to see it again for later tomorrow afternoon and evening. Watch for dust, blowing dust around the area, especially around the freeway. Be careful with that for this evening and the same thing for later tomorrow night. Thunderstorms, not much around Boise. They're kind of moving around us. We have that rain shadow effect here, so it's drying out toward Boise. But the further east you go, few thunderstorms here southwest of Glens Ferry and especially around Twin Falls. Not a thunderstorm yet, but they definitely have the moisture. And then when you look west of Ontario, western portions of Malheur County have thunderstorms. Some of uh, some pretty good size that are starting to develop out that way. So this pushes through for late this evening, so very late. Boise will be seeing it. Out here to the west, there's a little more moisture for very early tomorrow morning. Uh, I'd say about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. That's why I've got a light shower in the morning, but the temperature comes down. From 90 to 63 degrees, over 25 degrees it drops. 61 for Saturday, 64 for Sunday. When you look at Monday, it's 68 degrees. We start to warm up again next week, but we're in the 80s. But here we are, not in the record books. But I know about this one. We hit 90 degrees for the high temperature today. Ryan? 90 for the record books, for the history books. And we got another historical question from our call out this week. This one from our 208 Facebook group. Linda Graham asked us this. 
I'm curious about the cemetery in the middle of the Bridge Tower subdivision. Funny enough, Linda, I was curious as well about 17 years ago. And what I learned, well, it's called the Five Mile Cemetery. But I also wanted to know how they just decided to build up around it. So I took a walk. Lila Hill, a local historia, historian who specializes in the city of Meridian. She told me that particular cemetery is a pioneer one, which is not that unusual in Idaho. I mean, in fact, we just learned about Joplin's last week. What made this one unusual, though, is how they incorporated it in the subdivision. So here's the answer to your question, Linda, in today's 208 redial. By 2000, we were up and running. Bridge Tower is one of the latest subdivisions in Meridian. I think we're like 230 homeowners now. With the newest houses wrapping around the oldest eternal home. When we were looking at the land, yeah, we found out that this was on the property. Property that holds Meridian's pioneers. The Five Mile Cemetery. It's the oldest cemetery in Meridian, is that correct? It is. According to Lila Hill. Well, it was just a little plot that was set aside for burial in 1890. Lila is the town historian. So you know a lot about Meridian? Quite a bit. But little is known about who lies here. I can't tell you at this point a lot about them, but on top of the stone, there used to be a little lamb, and it's broken off here. Who's this here? This is George Nisbet. He uh, was one of the early settlers. This would be the early one, yes. This is Ezekiel for 1890. What Lila knows. They were all farmers, yes. Comes from old family letters like this one describing the passing of Priscilla. And she had gotten sick from a uh, injury on her leg. And skipping down, it says, Mother was buried in her black dress and her lace cap. She was buried by the side of Father. For the last week of her life, she talked to Father very much. He seemed very near her. That was written by... Charlie A. Lamb. The cemetery is small since it was only active for three years. Probably uh, as the only cemetery in the area for three years. Since then, the stones have stood by almost unnoticed. It just was overgrown with weeds and things like happens. Ten years ago, it was cleaned up, and eventually the property was sold for development. But removing these residents from their final resting place was never a consideration. No, they were there first, I think, you know, just leave it that way. But having grown up uh, as a youth uh, during the Poltergeist movie, it's not something you want to you want to bury over or try and hide. Besides, they're fairly quiet neighbors. That's true, yes. So here lies the city's oldest necropolis, holding its ground against Meridian's expanding metropolis. Well, life renews itself and renews itself and renews itself. Brian Holmes. I guess it's called progress. Idaho's News Channel 7. Has a plethora of knowledge about the city of Meridian, always has. In fact, she was awarded the 2017 Ada County Making History Award for her contributions to the preservation of Meridian's history. The Five Mile Cemetery did get some small landscape upgrades over the years since we first saw it back 17 years ago. There is a new sign that designates it as Meridian's first cemetery. They also see some trees added to it. They've expanded the grass. The fence is still there. There's even some homes, a few more homes now, surrounding this park. But even amongst the hustle and bustle of the booming city, the cemetery remains a peaceful little patch tucked behind some, well, kind of modern day architecture. The final resting place of some of the first people in Idaho, yep, it is still there. Even that iron fence, still part of the original plot. This is, yeah, a nice place to sit and kind of get a little reminder of where, well, we all will end up eventually.
All right, final minute here of the 208. Let's get to some of the questions you sent in and some of your comments as well. This one has to do with restaurants needing some help trying to hire people. You should reach out to the governor and talk to him about ending the extra unemployment benefit. Clearly, there are many jobs available. Restaurants and other small businesses are suffering greatly after an already rough year. I think believe, though, if I'm not mistaken, that extra $300 is a federal thing. I don't know if the governor can deny that or turn that down or not. It's a good question, though. We'll look into that. I know we have before, but I believe it is a federal program. Anyone remember when Republicans opposed the wasteful use of taxpayer money by the legislature? Steve talking about the extra money we're spending in this session, the debate over whether per diem should continue during pauses, all that kind of stuff. The legislature answered its own question about why the governor needs the authority to act quickly in a state of emergency. Karen from Garden City, best one of the day. They kind of took their time with this, didn't they?